And that is a good thing, is it not? Well, we're going to continue in James in chapter 2, picking up at verse 14. Where James writes, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Here we go. James emphasizes, if you didn't notice, the importance of putting into practice what we hear from God's word so that we are doers of the word because faith without works is dead. And James says true faith expresses itself in action, in deeds, particularly in acts of mercy, to widows and orphans, to those who are poor and in need. Faith that is lacking these kinds of actions and attitudes toward others, James says, is no faith at all. We are to live what we are taught in God's word. Luke Johnson, who wrote a very good introduction to the New Testament, observes the following. He writes, there is something deep inside human beings <laughs> that leads them to presume that knowing the right truth or holding the right position is enough to make them righteous. In other words, we mistakenly think if I say I believe something, or I say I know something, that that's sufficient, regardless of whether I actually do anything about it. The strong criticism that Jesus had for the Pharisees and the scribes was in part because, as Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 3, they do not practice what they teach. And because, as he says later in that same chapter in Matthew 23, 23, they neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced, Jesus says. Rather than living what we believe and being doers of the word, some people have other standards for being a faithful follower of Jesus. And some people seem to think that as long as you say a few almost magic words, that that's enough, 
and that it doesn't matter whether your words and deeds actually match up with what Jesus says we are to do. Now, for example, every now and then in the office, we'll get a call from someone asking what translation of the Bible we use in worship. And that's usually a sign that that person is checking to see if we are only using the King James Version of the Bible, okay? Because that's the version of the Bible that Jesus used. And, and they're checking to see if we are using this one particular English version that they believe is the only valid version of the Bible, even though the Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek with a little smattering of Aramaic thrown in. And I tell people when they ask me about this, you know, I look at a number of translations in preparing to preach, and I think it's important to be accurate. And some people seem to think, you know, it's more important to exclusively use just one English version of the Bible than it is to be accurate or to communicate effectively. Jesus is not looking for postures of piety. He wants to see lives that are daily being transformed by the Holy Spirit, that are striving to be consistent with what he taught. Because when our lives aren't consistent with what we say we believe, frankly, it's embarrassing. One of my favorite stories is the one about the stressed out woman who was driving down the street and she's tailgating the man in front of her and suddenly the light ahead turns yellow and the guy does the right thing and he stops. He stops before he gets to the crosswalk, even though he probably could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection. And the tailgating woman hit the roof, and she's leaning on the horn, and she's screaming out of in frustration and speaking sign language because she missed her chance to get through the intersection. And as she's still in mid-ranch, she hears a tapping on her window. And she turns and looks out her driver's window and sees a very serious police officer. And the officer orders her to exit the car with her hands up. And he arrested her and took her to the police station. She was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and put in a cell. And after several hours, the, a policeman approached the cell and opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking desk, and there was the officer who arrested her, waiting with her personal effects. And he looked at her and said, Ma'am, I'm terribly sorry for the mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn and flipping off the guy in front of you and cursing a blue streak. And I noticed the, what would Jesus do, bumper sticker. and the follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker, and the chrome-plated Christian fish on the trunk, and naturally I assumed you had stolen the car. <laughs> James is basically saying to us, you don't want folks to think you stole the car. We want to be doers of the word. We want to be people who have integrity in what we say and what we do. And the movement of Jesus in the world, since the beginning right up to the present, is hindered by the negative witness of people who claim the name, but not his life of love and healing and compassion and humility, and peace, and justice, and generosity, and caring for the poor. And not only do some people fail to do these things, too many self-proclaimed Christians are almost the opposite. Mean, uncaring, selfish, and dismissive, and demeaning of the poor and those who are hurting. Faith and works are inseparable in following Christ. They are like two sides of a coin. One is, by grace you have been saved, and not by work so that no one may boast. That's one side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is, faith without works is dead. They're both true. They're both true. Do you know twice as many Americans claim to be members of churches than actually participate in them? 
Many Christians run the risk of thinking that faith means nothing more than holding a private individual view. Faith is personal, but it's not private. And even the commitment to gather together to worship God with other believers seems unnecessary to some people. James says being a doer of the word requires both participation and perseverance. You know, it's easy to get so wrapped up in our busy lives. Our schedules get so crowded. And it doesn't matter whether you're retired or working, right? Our schedules get so crowded that we rush from one thing to the next and we can lose our patience and our perspective so that we fail to persevere in doing what we know is the most important thing to do. One day a seminary professor, he set up uh, his preaching class in a unique kind of way and he scheduled his students all to preach on the parable of the Good Samaritan from Luke chapter 10. But he set it up so that each student would go one at a time from one classroom to another where he or she would preach their brief sermon on the Good Samaritan. And the professor gave some students 10 minutes to get from one classroom to the other, and to some of the other students he gave much less time, forcing them to rush in order to get there and meet the schedule. And each student had to walk down one particular corridor past, past a poorly dressed man who was deliberately planted there, obviously in need of some sort of assistance. And the results were surprising and offered a powerful lesson because the percentage of these good men and women who were preparing for the pastorate, who stopped to help the man in the corridor, was extremely low, especially for those who were under the pressure of a shorter time period. The tighter the schedule, the fewer of the seminarians who stopped to help or to interact with the man. And after everybody had gone and the professor revealed to his class, the class of future spiritual leaders, you can imagine the impact on those good men and women rushing to preach a sermon on the Good Samaritan. They had hurried right past a man who symbolized the heart of the parable. We don't want that to be us. You know, James is writing to people who consider themselves to be good people, believers of God, followers of God, because they agree with the statement that God is one. And James says, in Chapter 2, verse 19, that isn't enough. Because even the demons believe and shudder. And the New Testament teaches us that believing in God, the ability to quote Scripture, and the ability to recognize who Jesus is, all three of these things, none of these means we have a life-saving or life-changing or Christ-like faith. In truth, Satan and demons can do all three of those things. Right? In Mark chapter 1 and verse 24, when Jesus is just beginning his ministry, and he's cleaning out an unclean spirit from a man, and the unclean spirit says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Just because I recognize who Jesus is doesn't mean I believe in him. And throughout Mark's gospel, we see over and over how Evil spirits recognize that Jesus is the Son of the Most High God. We know in the temptation of Christ in Matthew chapter 4 that the devil quotes Scripture to Jesus because Jesus quotes Scripture to him. So just because you can win a Bible quiz doesn't mean you believe what it says. Demons know the truth about God. Satan knows the truth about God but they've chosen not to serve God. They've chosen not to follow 
the leading of the Holy Spirit, they've chosen not to obey or love Christ. Jesus implores us to persevere in living what we believe so that our actions match what we say we believe. You know, there are still prominent and common people today, as there were in Jesus' time, who will say, I believe in God, who can quote the Bible, who will recognize who Jesus is, and yet their words and their deeds don't reflect the Spirit of Christ. And in Matthew chapter 7 and verses 21 to 23, Jesus has very strong words for those who are living under a misguided sense of self-perception. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evil doers. Saying we're a Christian while consistently doing things that Jesus would never do to another human being or habitually speaking in ways that the Bible clearly teaches is wrong, identifies a person as a hearer who forgets rather than a doer who acts. We are called to persevere in seeking to fulfill God's purpose for our life for the rest of our earthly journey. And being a Christian is kind of like being married. We're to be a doer of the word, right? Think of the vows a person says when they get married. You know, I take you to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or worse, right? For richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish so long as we both shall live, right? Right? That's true of our faith. That's what we're committing to. We're to be a doer of the word in good times and bad, in sickness and health, in times of prosperity and when we're just scraping by for as long as we live. You know, if I say, if you say, if we say we love someone, but we never make time to be with them, if we never serve them or bless them, if we never speak words of encouragement or affirmation to them, they may rightly question our love or our commitment and dedication to them because love motivates us to want to be with the one we love, right? And we want to serve and encourage and bless and let them know we appreciate them. That's what love looks like. Now, whenever people read James, whenever I preach a sermon on this part of James, there are always people who struggle with the relationship of faith and works or deeds. So let me just say again, as I said a few minutes ago, we are saved by faith in Christ, not by our own actions. Everyone heard me say that? Good. Our acts of love And our acts of service are the result of, not the cause of, our salvation. You heard me say that, right? But the action needs to be there. Or else the faith we think we have may merely be self-deception. And that's what Jesus and James say. Now, it's interesting to me, Jesus, James, and Paul all agree that our faith needs to be expressed by deeds of love. Paul writes in Galatians 5, in verse 6, the only thing that counts is faith working through love. That's Paul. So don't hear this, like, there's a difference between Paul and James thing. They're both saying the same thing. They're just coming at it from a slightly different angle. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. So says Paul. James says religion that's pure and undefiled cares for the lowly like orphans and widows. And concern and compassion for the poor exemplified by the most vulnerable in 
the culture at that time, like widows and orphans, that is seen as a sign of righteousness, of godliness, of holiness throughout all the pages of the Bible. In Exodus, in Deuteronomy, in Isaiah, and Psalms, and Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and Zechariah, just to name a few. The Lord says over and over and over again the same basic message. Here it is from Zechariah chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. Thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the orphan, the alien, or the poor. And do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. Sadly, this approach to life and to people seems to be sorely lacking, at least among some who claim to be followers of Christ today. And if what you see online and out there in the world, it even seems like there are people who are actually pursuing and pushing the exact opposite of what the Lord commands us to do. You know, life on earth is not merely preparation for eternity. It's the beginning of eternal life. It starts here and now. And eternal life begins when we accept Christ and when we begin to live the rest of our life for him. We don't want to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. As long as we're on earth, God calls us to do something about the very real problems of life. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, assisting the poor, visiting the sick and in prison, helping those who are being oppressed and abused, following the example of Christ and engaging in acts of mercy and compassion. And as we do what the word says, we will be blessed in our doing. There's an old saying, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? In what ways can you seek to build your case this coming week? Faith without deeds is inadequate. James says it's really not true faith at all. Faith with deeds transforms lives, beginning with our own. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the challenge that you give us from the letter of James. We thank you for how it pushes us and stretches us. And God, we pray that James would not lead us to say, yes, but, yes, however. <laughs> but God, I pray that you would help us to truly hear your call to live our faith in all that we say and all that we do and how we regard and treat other people. God, help us to be positive witnesses for Christ. We ask in his name. Amen.